And it's two minutes past eight here on the Bigger Brighter Breaky Show. It's a Thursday morning edition. It means one thing. It's sports fever time. Peter Swampy Marsh, welcome back to the studio. Been a few weeks, Matty, but no, very glad to be back in the studio. And look, always plenty of sports news to talk about when we only have a week between shows, let alone a couple of weeks. So, uh, look... Very excited for the big show ahead of us, and I think we need to, to kick things off. Uh, I, I trust you did your homework this morning, because I don't want to have to uh, send you home from the tour, because you uh, haven't submitted that little questionnaire I gave you over the two weeks. Yeah, sorry, Swamp. I was, I'm never real good oh, at homework. Dear. I was always a fella outside class, ready to go in, doing it at the last minute, trying to pinch a couple of answers. Well, do you perhaps subscribe to, to Warney's theory that you brought up overnight, that uh, we just need to lock in a room with everyone, turn on some music, have a few beers, and, and sort out your differences that way? He's lucky he could bail Warney. He's an interesting character, isn't he? Look, I'll tell you what, I've seen his, his, his Ashes team, and, and anyone, any team that has both on, on, on Reeks and, and Maxwell in it is uh, a little bit questionable to, to my eyes. He just to had honest. all these all round. He just threw every all round in Australia in the team. I don't know, Warney. He... Twitter's the worst thing that could have happened to Warney, that he can just get his opinion out all worst the time. Thing, worst thing to happen to Warney, best thing to happen to everyone else. Yes, I you think can so. always get a laugh out of it. It is, it is comedy value galore. But what, what do you make in all seriousness of the of homework gate? Look, it, it, I, and I, I, I believe them when they say that this isn't the first time that these indiscretions have been picked up. And it's it's these players that have been sent home, they're not... With the exception of James Pattinson, who I think probably, um, you know, this is a, a first slip up for him and is the, is the only player to come out of this and say, yep, I stuffed up, um, I'll take that on the chin, this is no one else's fault but me and I'm going to get back. Um, all these other players have had, you know, whispers and, and, you know, rumblings of, you know, they're not quite fitting in. We, you know, I think before the South Africa tour, we talked about how Shane Watson was out of favour. Um, and look, after, you know, Wanting and talking so much about wanting that opening spot on the test side hasn't delivered. He's got a quite a poor average, and, and it, it surprised me, and I think it would surprise a lot of people when you look at his average in test cricket. Mitchell Johnson is a, an enigma that, you know, I think you've got to take the good with the bad. It's, you're never going to be able to get a, you know, a, a consistent match winner from Mitchell Johnson. He'll be unplayable one day and, and you know, be carded for, for, for 10 runs and over the next and Usman Khawaja is, is a player with a hell of a lot of talent but uh, has long been you know, whispered about that he, he's not quite ready to do the hard work to get there. It, it's a really funny one because Queensland who he's moved to just this mm. year yet and Darren Lehman in particular and anyone out of that Queensland camp speaks so highly and the work that he's put in where the whispers continue to come out of Australia that he, you know they've, they've set him goals and tasks and he, he, he just wants the coast. Before he came into that Australian side, there were plenty of whispers that he he didn't quite gel well with some players in that side and that there were you know s- some internal strife there. And perhaps when he gets under a coach, uh, you know that, that's not Darren Lehman. Um, you know those some of those indicators that they, they, when he pushes himself, he switch off. Um, and, and he's not ready to do the hard work. And really, of all those players, uh, one that was you know. About to get his shot, Phil Hughes was was cooked. He was he was gone. Kawaja was in. He should have been ticking every box and, and doing everything necessary um, to you know. He's, he's got a chance to prove himself here, and uh, you know, after sitting on the sidelines for two tests, should really have had no excuse for not doing a little bit of team team work. It, it I mean, look, it, it looks heavy handed, but well, I see the reasoning behind it. When you look at those players and how they fit in, I genuinely think Shane Watson is only a fifty fifty chance to ever play Test cricket again. Um, he's Seems disheartened, and when you're getting cash thrown at you to be a, a travelling T20 player, like we've seen the likes of you know Gale do, um, you know if his heart's not in it, his heart's not in it, and probably shouldn't. I, do that. I think that uh, it gets to not, you know, it pops up, and then it's it's not. Him and Clark obviously yeah. hate each other, and and that's that's you know a, a big issue. And and I've heard uh, you know Wayne Bennett talk about players. Before he, he said, you don't have to get on, but you you need that respect still. Mm. He said, you, 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 two players can hate each other, but if they you know respect each other on the field, things can still work. And you know, throughout time, uh, Warney and, and Gilchrist mm. never really got on. But uh, I think what's missing is a lot of that respect from you know to the fellow players at, at the moment. So, and I think that's the biggest problem in the time team. And say what you will about Michael Clark, <laughs> the bloke is the only one keeping the Australian cricket team even some shred of respect at the moment and is scoring you know just ridiculous amounts of runs and look when you break it down to it you don't have to like the guy but he's a hell of a cricketer mm. um, and there's no denying that and these other guys just, just aren't up to snuff um, in terms of what they're producing on the field. No it's uh, 
It's interesting times in Australian cricket, but uh, did never think we'd see anyone, well, several players drop for for lack of homework. Well, it's, it's a new era, Matty. It is. It is. Well, if we think about it, you'd, years gone by, you never think you'd see anyone drop for, for being out on the drink and things like that. If you go back to, you know, it, it was really a behaviour that was was applauded mm. and you know if you look at your David Boones and your Rod Marsh and those type of players nowadays you know Andrew Simons tried it and, and he was the villain perhaps instead of the, the legendary story of 52 tinnies on a flight to England there'll be Ed Cowan's legendary story of 5,000 words on the flight Five, to England 5,000 words or less <laughs> <laughs> turning locally though Matty big result for the Caboolture Snakes at the weekend I hope you're sitting down because this is extraordinary what they managed to do they were 4 for 12 in their 2 day semi-final against Maroochydore the fourth wicket came with a run out at the non-striker's end that a bowler managed to tip with his fingers and run out Jacob Wilson, who was a very sorry figure as he walked off the field, as you can imagine. And Look, you'd think at 4 for 12 with that happening, you can sign yourself to... You give up, don't you? you well, think, well, today's not our day. Days, yep. Exactly. Would you believe that the Snakes went on to make 446 and bowl Maruchador out for 230-odd and make the grand final against Gimpy this weekend? I would say one of the... Of all time... One of the great cricketing comebacks. In, incredible story at the weekend with the, the Snakes Premier Grade. At 4 for 12, we saw a 160-run partnership between Luke Schmelzkoff and uh, Andrew Shablon. Sorry, Shablon's name escaped me there for a second. Uh, Schmelzkoff with 90-odd, uh, Shablon with 100. Uh, incredible stuff there to, to, to right the ship. The Snakes were still, you'd say... Know, not doing very well at 7 for 216 before Jason Voris, Matt Anderson came together for a club record 183 run stand for the 8th wicket to push the Snakes to 446. So uh, 150 to Matt Anderson and a very solid 40 to Jason Voris who was holding up and in there while uh, Matt Anderson did all the damage. So just an extraordinary couple of partnerships there for the Snakes after losing four very, very good batsmen in Clayton Simpson, Cameron Garnham, Jacob Wilson, you know, right at the top of the order in the first 45 minutes of play. Uh, an incredible comeback there and uh, with seven to seven to eight runs and over to score from Maruchidor, you know, at the sort of tee, sorry, at the starters of the second day on Sunday, it was always going to be a tough task. So a big congratulations to the Snakes out through to the grand final this weekend starting against Gimpy. It's a three-day match, so it'll be Saturday, Sunday, and next Saturday. We might have to get uh, get one of the boys on next Thursday to talk about how that game is going ahead of the, the final day. How dejected would Marucci do have been? They've been clapping 4 for 12. We've got them on the ropes. Yeah. This is it. We've got the big names. Then, wow. What, a, what about Schmelzkopf? He's a, he's a sports fever favourite. He is, he's a great. By all reports, at 4 for 12, he went in there and, and played cricket like Luke Schmelzkopf plays cricket. There's, there was no blocking out an hour and seeing how we go. He went in there, played shots, um, you know, played his own game and really surprised Maruchidor. And, and look, you think the, the 160 run stand there saved the match for Kabulcha and then the stand between Forrest and Anderson won it for them. So two very important partnerships from four very good players and uh, they'll take a lot of confidence from that. Uh, Often in those situations, attack is the best form of defence, isn't mm. it? it, it only, only way out of trouble is to hit your way out of trouble. So, well done to the Caboolture boys. That is a great story. Uh, what else in local sports form? Look, it's cricket finals across the Sunshine Coast this weekend, Matty. We've got uh, a great local derby in Division 2 between Caboolture and Burpengary. So, uh, a very, very good game there. Those two teams have fought it out for the, the trophies in Division 2. All year have been... Even when they're not two of the best sides in the competition, there's a big rivalry there. They are the head and shoulders above the, the two best sides in the competition this year. So there's plenty of chirp happening off the field, and uh, look, it's going to be a great game when those two play. Also, right the way down, there's uh, teams from right across Burping, Gary, Caboolture, and, and from further up the Sunshine Coast that will be playing. So uh, a big best of luck to all those guys out there. And a quick shout-out as well, all our netball fixtures right across the region start this weekend. Huge days on Saturday for both Caboolture and Pine Rivers and Redcliffe Netball Associations. Um, some 177 teams from Pine Rivers, over 100 teams for Caboolture. So best of luck to all those girls who are starting their winter netball fixtures on Saturday. Yeah, looking forward to that one. Time for a song, and then we're into NRL. This, What do you think of the new NRL song, Jessica Melboy? Eh, it's not simply the best. No, it's not. So we're going to play Simply oh, the Best. Because it is very good. Simply the Best. 16 minutes past eight here on 101.5. You listen to Sports Fever with Matthew and Swampy. And joining us on the line 
Now, it's been a week in the waiting. We tried to get him on last week. Phone troubles. Warwick Nicholson, good morning to you. Am I really here? You are. <laughs> you are. Now, we'll just before before we uh, played that song, where, where do you view uh, Jessica Melboy's song compared to Simply the Best Was? Where do you sit? Look, it's, it's OK. Uh, I don't think it's that much of an improvement on the old Bon Jovi tune, but it's solid. Uh, they can build on it from here, but at the end of the day, they've sort of fell short of, I think, the emotion that uh, Simply the Best and even what you get is what you see sort of built with Tina Turner. Exactly. It's you know the fact that we're 20 years on still talking about Tino. It's a fair wrap on what a campaign it was. But on to season 2013 was uh, probably as league lovers, it's not the type of headlines we've wanted to start the year. What what's the latest on the shark? I guess debacle. Well, when is the government ready to uh, step in and make things happen? That's the real question. Um, I wrote an article on my website this week, wnicholson.com, and that was basically that it's grandstanding on the government's part in a lot of senses. This Asada press conference we had what back in early February. There's going to be changes. We're going to fine sheet, blah, 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 blah. We're a month and a bit from there, and the Sharks are facing oblivion because nothing's actually been proven, and it's a real concern because how many people, six people, have now lost their jobs at the Sharks? Uh, how many players are facing up to two years out? if they're proved to have taken allegedly horse drugs. This is why I really am worried about um, the, the motives behind why the, uh, the government press uh, conference happened a month ago. Was it... Prove something, come and do it. Don't it... say you're going to do something and then leave everybody in lurch for the next month. It seems to be a concern that Asada might not have the actual staff on board here to be able to, 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 to move anything quickly, and I think it, it hurts... It hurts a, a hell of a lot of players when there, there's rumour and speculation about what might have happened or what could be happening uh, floating around for, for months on end before we do get anything concrete. Um, is that sort of the, the, the feeling that a lot of, I suppose, you know, not to be forgotten here, there are a lot of clean players that are being lumped in here and, and whispers being talking about, you know, talked about them when they've done nothing wrong. Uh, I, I get the feeling that um, everyone wants this to, if, if they're dirty, name them, kick them out and let's get all this you know, moving forward. Oh, absolutely. I think you've got to clean up the game. Whether you can clean out the game is another matter. Mm. And, and my worry really is that the Sharks end up being the scapegoat. They lose half a dozen players or whatever it is. And every other club that's got people that are maybe allegedly attached to this um, issue get away with it because the Sharks have basically taken the fall. That's my biggest concern. I don't think you can pick and choose. Well, if I was doing it involved in this order, you can't pick and choose your clubs and do it in an order. You've got to work, line up everything and then bring the hammer down when it's supposed to happen. And I'm fine with that. If people have cheated and are doing things that are against the spirit of the game, then get rid of them. But don't get rid of them one in May, one in June, one in September. It's just ridiculous. And I suppose some of the ramifications that have been talked about for, for the Sharks was uh, are really concerning. Where's this, this leave them as a, as a club? It's, it's you know... The financial, it's been long talked about how the financial position is, is not great and it was a real year of hope for, for, for the side with some big signings. Where will this leave the Sharkies if we see you know upwards of 10 players rubbed out? Well, if any club can probably deal with it, it's probably them because of the way they've recruited the last two years because allegedly those players they've signed in the last uh, 24 months are probably clean. So they'll have a still a decent side, I guess, to put out in the park. As for the future, they've got this development thing that they claim they've got millions of dollars coming in, uh, redeveloping Shark Park and uh, the whole area around it. So the money situation is going to clear up. The real issue for them is what happens if half their team does disappear? Uh, the goodwill aspect of um, will the Sharks ever be considered a clean club and the rest of it, that comes into, into play. I don't think you'll see them disappear. I don't think you'll see it moved for at least another five years, but if it happens in the future, I mean, the, word, the words Perth Shark, Adelaide Shark, something even said to Brisbane Sharks the other day. I, I personally would prefer to see them stay in Cronulla because I think it's important we've got a team down there. Um, but look, until something's proven, we're all speculating, and that's the real problem, is that I think the Sharks last week particularly got up for that game against the Titans. And they've got to wait over a week to play the bunnies, and I think you'll see a massive drop off in intensity. And I think, you know, that's the hardest thing for the players is that they've got back to training this week and reality is stuck in. 
they can't move to Brisbane was. We've got the Caloundra Sharks playing up in the Sunshine Coast comp, so uh, there'll be a double up there. That won't be allowed. Caloundra Sharks will blow up. What about, what about the Dolphins? Can we use that? Well, no. You know how that went down last time was. That's a that's a very touchy subject here on Sports Fever. Now, away to, I guess, onto other headlines that have disappointed us as league lovers. A couple of weeks ago, we seen Ben Barber in trouble and, and into rehab, and then uh, another fullback behaving badly, uh, Josh Dugan, in trouble was. As a Canberra fan, there's you know word that he's going to be either released or sacked today. It's got a kind of Todd Carney feel over, all over again for, for Canberra fans. Well, the um, total amount of indiscretions that Todd Carney was supposed to have done before he finally got sacked by the Raiders was about 35. Now, that can range from anything from being late to a training session not following like a diet or whatever it is, but apparently it was about 35. So the question I've got is, what do you think the over-under on Josh Dugan is? About 15 and a half indiscretion? The last one was pretty good. Um, this is after he was saying the way through last year that he would never drink well and do it again. He was committed to the cause. I think the biggest thing to look at the Dugan situation as opposed to the Barber one is that, remember, at the end of last year, everything was great for the Raiders. They were in the playoff race. They won a playoff game. And you're so close to a brand final, you're so close to a title, everything that you have to do, um, training-wise and obeying rules-wise, it makes sense because you're so close to what you're actually aiming for. Well, you're a long way from the top of the hill now at the start of the season. You play terribly in the first game, you play injured in the first game, you get hurt again in the first game. You think about this generation and the whole idea of uh, how they view self-gratification instantly and all that kind of stuff. The hill's too far away. He's going to just say, stuff yeah, I'm Josh Dugan. That's how I feel is the situation here. He's just thinking it's too far away to, to get to what he wants to aim for. And he figures, well, if I can get sacked, I can get go somewhere else and make more money and the rest of it. And that's the problem, is that it's too easy for players to do this. It's too easy in this age of contracts being torn up and they're not really meaning a lot. And I think that's really the core here. I don't think it's the same thing as Barber. Um, but I don't doubt that Josh Dugan's got some attitude issues he's got to deal with. It, uh, I thought it annoying was personally, and I know you would as, as a Canberra fan that, and it's what you touched on that players behaving badly. It's so hard now for clubs to to take a stance on this type of behaviour because they know if they sack them, they're just going to end up at another club and probably come back and hurt them. Well, that's the problem. I think there's a lot of talk from Canberra, particularly in the uh, from the Canberra Times down there, that you know they don't understand how Canberra do release him. And they've had a board meeting this morning. It involved John Grant and David Smith. Um, that were down there, basically saying, do we sack him? And if we sack him, can he play for another club this year? Um, what's the... Because the thing is, what he's actually done isn't that bad. It's more the disrespect that he's shown to the club. And from what I understand, they didn't actually get in contact with him directly until he's supposedly uh, fronting the board either this morning or this afternoon. So he hasn't even had the decency to ring, ring them back or check his voice messages. So that's the real issue is the respect factor. It's not like he's gone um, off on a binge or, or something like that. My worry with the, the Dugan situation is that, yes, he gets released. Yes, someone picks him up. I put Parramatta up there yesterday on an um, article on my website because they can't give away $500,000 a year at the moment. So why not uh, Josh Dugan? It was, believe it or not, uh, and I'm sure some people will be shocked to hear there were some games of football played on the weekend, and uh, I'm sure plenty of fans were happy to see that roll around, and, and some, some really good games, so some poor games from sides. Uh, what do you matter the wash-up of round one? I think the big upside was that Sydney actually out through Brisbane in the season open. Did you notice that, boys? Yes, we did, was. Yes, well, you know, population-wise, you probably would you. It's about time, isn't it? Yes. Uh, look, I was there on the SFS Thursday night. 35,000 people. The game itself wasn't amazing, but great to have the floor back. And I think for a lot of fans, if they can get to a game where it's a full house, they're going to appreciate the value of going into games. Uh, I think we saw that with the Sharkies on Saturday night. Um, I mean, you guys had a probably a bit of a down crowd for Manly, but it was still a solid 30,000. And poor weather on the Friday as well yeah, was. Right, I think yeah. we had an incident earlier in the day at a, a local shopping mall, so that probably didn't help either. Um, and I just... I look at it, if you can't get out for round one, can't get out for round two, then the people that didn't draw good crowds this week are going to be worried about their crowds for the rest of the year. I mean, you know, Parramatta fans will come out and they will work big time this weekend, but they only had 17,000 for a season opening as a team they probably expected to beat. This is the issue, I think, with crowds particularly. you just got to push forward. If you can't get good crowds right now, you've got to win about eight games before the fans turn back up again.
Yeah, it's, it's disappointing. Round one, you know, full of hope. If you can't draw a crowd, you're exactly right. We are in trouble. Now, on what you've seen in round one, has anything changed on, on your top eight predictions? We, we got you on it last week to... To give you, a, you know, round, you know, top eight predictions, you've held off a week sneakily with the phone excuse. Hit us with your top eight for 2013. Melbourne Storm, they're at the top and they deserve to be. Uh, until someone's good enough to knock them off, they get the minor premiership. Uh, Rabbitohs in second. Uh, the Bulldogs, even though I knew the Ben Barber situation, and the great news about that is apparently you could be playing as soon as round four, uh, which I don't think is a massive surprise to many people, but just good to see him back in the game. The Broncos in third, uh, Bulldogs in third, sorry. Uh, Cowboys in fourth, there's my top four. Starting to waver on my fifth position, which was the Raiders. Uh, the Sharks in sixth, so they could both end up way out of contention. Uh, that was the Seagulls in seventh, so the Knights in eighth, which means your Broncos are in ninth, and I've got the Roosters in tenth. I don't think the Tigers, Titans, Dragons, Warriors, Panthers or Eels will worry the scorers. Who gets a wooden spoon was? Parramatta, don't worry about the fact they beat the Warriors. They were only up by eight points with 20 minutes to go on the weekend. There we go. There's the good mile from Woz. And, and have you got a Dally M tip for us? Uh, well, it would have been Ben Barber. He might struggle at the moment. Uh, I'm going to go with Greg Inglis, but a little smoky here. If the Bulldogs are as good as I think they probably can be without Barber, even if he does come back, Josh Reynolds is the kind of player that picks up points regularly. So if you want a little flutter on a uh, outsider, Josh Reynolds is the man. Very good, Woz. You're always not far from the mark. We've got this. We've hit record. This will be podcast. So if you're wrong, if the Broncos win the grand final, we're hitting this come October, early October. Was it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure you'll go uh, bring out the experiment. Yes, mate. Yes, we will. Yes. It's just give it to Hodges, isn't that the, isn't that the game? That, well, mate, that, it seems to work very well. Just get it to Hodge. Uh, always good to talk to you, mate. We'll no doubt touch base throughout the year, uh, particularly around Origin time. It's been great the last seven years or so having a chat to you. I know we haven't even been on air that long, but it just feels like forever. It feels like that long, mate. It does. Good on you, Woz. It's uh, good to talk, and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Woz. Cheers, Woz. He knows his stuff. He does, and he's not far off the mark. Was on, on, on any of the mail that he does give us, Matty, and didn't do a lot on the Broncos there, but we were both there on uh, on Friday night, and some look, some very good signs in the first half there for, for, for Brisbane, but uh, a disappointing second half despite... The almighty power of the rally towel. Uh, a, a tough, tough second half for the Broncos, and a few questions to answer this week. Yeah, well, it was disappointing, but you never can take out. You know, there's a lot of sensationalism out of round one. Everyone's like, "Oh, this team's gone. It's going to be." Oh, you know, the Johns brothers come out and said, "Oh, it's going to be a long year for the Broncos." Like, you see, teams can lose it. The first five games and storm home. Like, people just love jumping on a bandwagon. It was a. a Seven to ten minute period were mainly piled on all their points and deservedly so. And you know, around one side, that probably got kicked, had the wind kicked out of them, just uh, struggled to, to get back in that match. It also started to rain in the second half as well, which made obviously you know the, the ball very slippery and, and, and tougher to, to really get get something going and attack there for the Broncos. But the first forty minutes was was, was some great football and. Overall in the game, some, some wonderful form showed by Matt Gillette, uh, who, of course, started in the second row. Yeah, Gillette was very impressive. And, you know, there was some disappointing performance and some good performance. Hoffman on the wing was strong. Uh, Manly, are, Manly are a good team. I think they, I think what set up their win was, despite Broncos being in front at half time. I, I think Manly won that forward battle mm. and, and Broncos started to play with tied legs in the second half and, and Manly were able to run over the top of them. Look, we know Hook Griffin. We're a huge rep for Hook Griffin here, the coach. He'll he'll get some improvement out of this side. Look, I don't think it's as bad as all the uh, naysayers are, are saying. They're not going to be that top two type of side. But no. I, yeah, look, the rest of the comp is very even. Um, look, I, I think it's going to be probably one of the most even comps we've seen in a long time. And on news of, of local talent that possibly featuring in that Broncos side. And like you said, not eager get to read too much into round one. But uh, with some question marks over... Corey Orton's performance for the Broncos and whether or not he's even going to be there beyond this year, uh, it, it really opens up, and we were talking off air, a, a big door there for Joe Bond, of course, from, from the Dolphins signed there this year. Um, if, you know, if they're looking for another attacking option there, which they were probably lacking a little bit on Friday night, it uh, really puts Joe Bond in that frame, especially with they seem to be liking Hoffman on the wing. It, and that's an incredible turnaround, really. You know, Only a couple of weeks ago, it looked like a, a very tough road for Bond to, to break into that Broncos team behind perhaps two fullbacks, but all of a sudden 
there's just a little bit of a feeling, and I think you probably agree, Matty, that um, you know if, if things continue the way they are, he might be getting a look in, say, round five or round, round five, six or seven. I think the thing is, if, we, if they're going to go with the halves combination of, of Prince and Wallace, I, I know they kind of wanted that, that playmaking role from fullback, which Hoffman, while in your traditional fullback sense, is, is brilliant. He probably just lacks that, that playmaking role that, that really evolved from, you know, Darren Lockyer, and we've seen other players really good at it at since. Bond kind of gives you that, that double whammy. It gives you that, that X factor, I guess, for lack of a better word, that, that, that Barber has created. So he's got that brilliant pace where he can, you know, reap dividends off, off Prince and Wallace, but can also create his own magic. So he kind of does offer up something different than, than what Norman or Hoffman could. So there, there is a chance for Bondy there, but uh, only time will tell. Anyway, we better play a few words from our sponsors. We'll play a song and be back to talk some Dolphins news. 23 minutes to nine here on Sports Fever with Matthew and Swampy. Time now to talk some Dolphins news. And joining us on the line is one of the real stars from the uh, Dolphins lineup over the last couple of years. He's been named in the front row for uh, the round one clash versus the Wynnum Seagulls at Cougarai Oval. Joining us on the line is Nick Sliney. Good morning to you. Morning, boys. How are you? You look, we're really, really good here, Nick, and uh, eagerly anticipating round one of the Queensland Cup getting started for the Dolphins, at least on Sunday afternoon. Now, it doesn't get much bigger than a game against Wyndham and a grand final rematch to kick off the season, Nick. Um, how are you feeling ahead of round one, mate, and how's the, the team getting up for what's sure to be a, a very big clash over there at Cougarai? Uh, mate, I'm feeling pretty good, and uh, I'm pretty sure the team's uh, ready to play some footy because I think it's been a pretty long pre-season for all the boys so I think we're all a bit excited to finally play a game. Yes, it's uh, been a long time coming and of course we don't like to bring it up but it was a, it was a disappointing finish to season 2012 after such a such a great year. What has John Dixon, has he used that as ammunition or has that been put in the past? What, what's the talk of uh, season 2012, Mick? Uh, I don't think it's been put, put in the past. I suppose you can never really forget a game like that. But like you said, it was probably it was probably the worst game of the year that we played. And um, it hasn't really been brought up too much about it because there is a few new guys in the team so that didn't, didn't play on that day. So I think it's more like you can never really take get that back, that game. So we'll try and move on. Speaking of a few of those new guys in the team, Nick, we see a, a, a new... new uh, Half in, in Zach Strasser there, joining, of course, Player of the Year Luke Capewell last year, along with Sarafu Fariaki and, and Jake Marchetto uh, as well. Uh, how are those new boys uh, fitting into this side? And, and I suppose as a player that's been there the last couple of years, what are you looking to see from them in round one? Um, yeah, well, like I said, like Strasser's there. He, he's played, he played a couple of games last year, made his Queensland Cup debut and that. And, and those other boys that you mentioned, they're, um, <coughs> they're very quality players with... Um, Saraf and Jakey Marchetto playing a bit of NRL last year, so probably what I'm just looking for there is just buying into the team and I guess and just giving it a red hot crack, red crack, red hot go I guess. So. And and what about your front row partner this week, uh, Nick uh, Petro Simdesiva? What what has he brought to the team? I know it, it's for one, it's brought great exposure to the Queensland Cup in round one. There's been a lot of articles written uh, about Petro, and I know he's a very humble man. He he wouldn't want this to be about him. But what what has he brought to uh, the Dolphins so far this season? Um, apart from what you just mentioned, probably a bit of a professionalism, I guess. Like he's he sort of hasn't just turned up and just expected expected just to play every week like he's he's working just as hard as all the boys and he comes to all the training sessions and <clears throat> does it, does all the little things that he used to do I think at NRL level so I guess that's sort of what he's brought to the team showed the boys that doesn't doesn't matter if you're not playing NRL you still got to be professional. Now one uh, big name that we haven't seen in Dolphins or Broncos colours for a little while who plenty of fans will be eager to see back this week is uh, the big bopper Dave Harlett named on the bench, Nick. Uh, how's uh, Dave winding up? He's a, he's a man that I wouldn't want hungry coming off the bench as an opposition player, I'll tell you that much. No, it's, uh, and I think he will be a bit hungry because he hasn't played for a fair while. So, no, he, he's, he's looking good. He's looking pretty fit for the big fella and <clears throat> I'm pretty sure he's going to unleash, hopefully, on Wynnum. Now, on, on you, yourself, Nick, uh, of course we saw last year the, the first year of, I suppose, uh, your affiliation with the Broncos and, and, of course, playing playing some games with the Dolphins, uh, getting a couple of cracks at, at first grade with the Bronx last year. Uh, looking to add to that in, in 2013? 
Oh, definitely. That's probably my one of my main goals this year is to try and play as much NRL as possible for the Bronco, Broncos. It's uh, sh- sure, and actually, before we do wrap it up, uh, a-, a really tough draw for for the Dolphins in these opening rounds. Uh, we've got, of course, Wyndham first up, then I believe East, and then Tweed. It's uh, certainly a bit of a baptism of fire this year for the Dolphins, isn't it? It is. Well, we're going to test ourselves against those teams and see where we're at. I guess so. I don't, I don't think you'd want it any other way. So that's uh, good. No, I can't wait to have the footy back. It is the. Uh, Channel 9 game on Sunday as well and then the following week we are back at Dolphin Oval. Can't wait to see the red and white back in action on Dolphin Oval. Best of luck for this weekend Nick. We'll all be behind you here at Sports Fever and no doubt we'll catch up with you throughout the year. Alright, thanks guys. Cheers, Cheers Nick. Nick. Nick Sliney there from the Red Cliff Dolphins. He's a real workaholic and, and I reckon if we were to do a, I guess a three year Peter Lee's medalist Nick Sliney would be, I, no doubt, I, I'd say, the, the the best player in the last three years. Of course, did win the Peter Lease medal in 2011, I think it was. So, yeah. what, One of the Dolphins' absolute best uh, the last couple of years. A, a real star for the club and, like you said, a, a real workaholic who's, who's not afraid to, to get in and, and do the do the dirty work. And it wins him a lot of fans and also wins him a lot of respect among his teammates. Um, you know, there's... You look at the, the players' player uh, along with the Men of the Match Awards and it, there's a lot of the time where it goes to, to one end Solani both times. So uh, a, a wonderful addition to the Broncos. Uh, sorry, the, both the Broncos and wonderful for the Dolphins to, of course, uh, maintain that affiliation with Nick given that they uh, supplied him up and, uh, and, you know, of course, brought him through in that 2011 season. So uh, great to have him back in the side. Overall, Matty, uh, what do you make of the Dolphins' side this week? It's... Uh, Probably one of the strongest, I think, that we've seen named in in a little while. Um, a lot of firepower um, coming back from the Broncos, and I hesitate to use that, t- that term a little bit because these aren't players that are, are, are strangers to Redcliffe. They're ones that have had plenty of affiliation um, with the Dolphins, and they're going to bolster uh, some really good new faces and some, some old ones as well. Look, it's a really well-balanced side, mm. Swamp. That forward pack is so powerful, like Sliney and Petro up front. Uh, we mentioned Jake Mercado, with who I'm really surprised wasn't picked up by another mm. NRL club, and then Harler off the bench, and, and Isaac Almao also off the bench. It's just just such a powerful forward pack, um, and then you've got I, I'd say arguably one of the fastest back lines in rugby mm. league, not not just the Queensland Cup, right across the NRL to have have the, the seven players. I know. Paul Ivan's probably not the quickest, but got the long stride on him as well. He's a hard man to catch. He can cover ground quickly. Like that, that is just speed plus in that back line. And certainly in, in the trial, that, that in the couple of trials that I've seen, Paul looks to be back to that, that really explosive centre that um, you know earned him a chance for a bit of preseason training at the Dolphins at the start of last year. Of course, experimented a little bit um, with the, the second row last year with some sort of hit and miss results. But uh, looked to, to be back to that really dangerous centre player in that game against Wyndham, and you know just running over the top of guys and, and finding holes, and you know back to the pull off, and they got plenty of attention. So in, good to see him back in that position this year. I, the thing that really strikes me is the amount of backup support players in the, in this team. Yeah. Like the, if if there's a break, literally there will be a swarm of players. Yeah. Just be Kate will. I know the Walker brothers rate Capewell as one of the best support players they've, they've ever had anything to do with it. We've seen Joey Bond last year. Liam Georgetown's still on this incredible try-scoring streak. Uh, I think, what is it, 16, 17, 18 tries in his last game. He scored at least one try in every game. So that streak's still alive. Um, Dan and Kemp is a name we haven't mentioned a lot. He is one of these that probably doesn't have a Dolphins affiliation that's been uh, picked up into this, this Red Cliff allocation. We seen what he could do at the Broncos a couple of years ago. He's one of the most freakish players. Look, he's he's had his ups and downs there since. More or less, had given the game away, thrown a lifeline by the Broncos. He's got to you know do it the tough way back through Queensland Cup. But if he finds a glimmer of that form he did from a couple of years ago, he he is the most exciting player going around. Like you said, Liam Georgetown still on that incredible streak. And I had a quick word to Lummy earlier in the week, and he's. Of course, had a little bit of an injury layoff that really probably cost him a, a, a crack at a few of those Broncos trials. But interesting to, to when you think back, he did not miss a game last year, and that included representative sides. He was straight back in the Dolphins side after playing, you know, one or two games, uh, you know, in the space of a week. Um, 
it's, it was a long 2012 for Liam Georgetown at the absolute peak of, um, you know, of quality across the competition. So that injury was probably a little bit of a blessing in disguise for him. It's given him a good chance to, to have a rest, take stock of, of a lot of things. And look, he, he said he's, he's feeling fresh, he's ready to go. He's completely over that injury that um, held him back a little bit in pre-season and he'll be uh, ready to, to really rip in at the weekend. And look, I've no doubt that uh, we'll see some of those wonderful combinations that we do with Georgetown to Bond for a few tries this year. Yes, yeah, looking forward to it. And just quickly on some of those other sides, there's a real red clip feel to a couple of other sides, isn't there? Former players, of course, the East Tigers... Mm. Our sports fever favourite Tom, Tommy Butterfield in the number nine jersey there for the uh, uh, East Tigers this year, as well as former uh, Sunny Coast and Dolphins player Todd Murphy in the halves, and also Troy Jesus' brother Grant, 5'8 for the Tigers this year. Boxer Mars not far from making that side as well, and mm-hmm. former Dolphins player. And then if you have a look at the South Logan team, you've got Dave Fermita, who was a leading try scorer in uh, Fogs Cup last year for the Dolphins. You've also got Reese Jacks, who I think probably would have played Queensland Cup if not for an untimely injury early in the season at Wynnum last year. And also you've got Chris Faust, who uh, big things were expected of last year for the Dolphins, and he had a few injury problems himself. So a a couple of uh, names there. And Zach Lemberg, who, of course, played for the Dolphins. So a lot of Dolphins flavour in a few of those other sides. Yeah, and look, I mean... That's the, I suppose the um, the curse that comes with being on top of the competition right across the board. That Matt is that they're, they're players that are probably good enough to get a run at um, Queensland Cup level at other clubs that, that just couldn't crack that Dolphin side last year. And uh, you know you, you can't really hold it against them for wanting to chance their arm at, at another club. And you know they look, most of those players that we've talked about there were sort of fringe Q, Q Cup players at the Dolphins last year and look to have got their shot there this year. So. I mean, there'll be plenty of familiarity in the competition as they uh, as they go ahead, and I think that East Tigers game will be very will be very interesting when it does roll around. Uh, a few, plenty of uh, old friendships going to be tested on the field, and even some sibling friendships by the look of it. Uh, Troy G has been keen to uh, keen to line a few blokes up. It'll be interesting if he if he targets the number six there for the Tigers. He will. <laughs> no, no love lost between brothers. Time for a word from our sponsors, and we'll be back to talk local union. It's 10 minutes to 9 here on 101.5. Vision Sports Fever with Matthew and Swampy. Now, Swampy, last year, Kabulcha Rugby had an amazing year, didn't they? A real fairy tale. You don't get them too often in sport, Matty. And, look, it was definitely one of those for the Kabulcha Snakes uh, last year. 30th anniversary year, won through to the grand final, claimed their first title, and did it by a point over Noosa in the dying seconds of the game. So a wonderful year, but uh, new to the side this year is a new head coach, and we've got him on the line to give us the full preview before the Snakes kick off this weekend. Uh, welcome to Sports TV, Jason DeCork. Hello, how are you guys doing? We're really good this morning here, mates, and uh, very excited to see the Snakes return for 2013. Before we get to the side for the year, Jason, give us a bit of a, uh, a rundown of, of your own rugby union career and uh, I suppose what led you up to this point in taking the job with the Snakes. Well, um, well I'm a South African and playing in South Africa a few years ago, I, I played nationally at junior level, South African schools and South African under 19, and I also played a bit of Vodacom Cup and Curry Cup, and, and I came to, to Australia because my mom lives here, and I be, haven't been seeing her for about five years, so I came here, and a few years ago, um, I met up with the club when I was here, visiting her, and uh, got into the club as soon as I got back here because these are, they are a lovely bunch of guys. It's uh, wonderful to have that that experience that, that you bring from uh, playing a, a lot of a lot of union in South Africa, Jason. Um, now, of course, a, a big year for the Snakes last year, um, and you know it's a, going to be a really interesting scenario this year. The, for so long, they were the, the hunters, or, or even at times the easy beats of this competition. How are you going to get the boys up to, uh, to to really challenge for that title again in 2013? Well. Um just get the numbers up, get the guys to the club, and um, if we all train well and I can actually show them what I know, then we'll, we might get there. It all depends on guys working, and uh, like we know, the last few weeks, if the rain stays away, we can train. Now, of course, there, there are a couple of losses to this side in uh, in Tarn Keel, uh, Jay Forrester and Porrick Boland, who have been called up to, uh, to to play on the Stingray side, the representative side from the Sunshine Coast. Uh, a couple of t- tough losses there for you. Yes, they are. Um, what I've seen about them and the way they play, they bring a lot of a lot of um, power and strength and, and, and speed to the team and also a lot of confidence. They 
they handle the team well, they make good decisions, and with them there or not there, you know, the team does have a bit of a, a loss. But with a lot of other guys at the, at the club, we actually can fill up those positions with um, guys that have lots of talent. And certainly not to forget at all that the reserves had a very good season last year as well. So no shortage of talent there to, to, to hopefully step up and, and fill those uh, fill those spots that the boys did leave. Now a uh, huge game season, of course, starting at the weekend at Kevin Kazer Oval. Uh, a big grand final rematch against Noosa to kick things off on Saturday afternoon. How are the boys feeling ahead of their first game, Jason? Oh, everybody's really excited. It's the only, it's the only game they've been talking about because they know it. You know, that revenge match and everybody's wanting to either see them lose or see them win again. But um, everybody's excited. They've been working hard. And uh, what's the only thing they really talk about? Jason, it's going to be hopefully another very successful season for the Snakes in 2013. As we said earlier, all starts this Saturday. Best of luck for the season. Sure, it's going to be a, a tough one with that target on the backs, but uh, plenty of belief in the Snakies and what they can do. So best of luck and thanks for your time this morning, Jason. Thank you very much, and thanks for giving me the time, and uh, let's go Kabulcha. Absolutely. Cheers, Jason. Let's go to the Snakes. Thanks, Jason. Of course, in the year of the Snake Swamp, so that's that's the, the sequel to the amazing story we've seen last year. That's got the title already on it. Well, look, it's, it's going to be a... I mean, every, every, any, any person in, in any sport knows how tough it is to go back-to-back titles in, in anything, um, and it's going to be no different for the Snakes this year, and uh, of course, come, coming with that success last year, those players that, that to be honest, had had offers from the Sunshine Coast uh, previously, but have wanted to stay with Caboolture to claim that title, um, of course, you know, had the chance to take that up this year, and, and absolute best of luck to, to those three boys up there who have taken the opportunity to, to further their, their, their union careers. Um, so going to be tough without a lot of firepower there, but... Uh, a lot of experience from Jason, um, a strong reserve side last year, so some, some new faces to come up into that side. They've probably been you know, waiting to have their crack, and I'll tell you what's going to be a huge afternoon at Kevin Kay's arrival this, uh, this Sunday afternoon. Kick-off in the main game is at 3.15. So, yeah, some great, uh, great local sport. Also, some more local sport on this uh, weekend in the Moreton Bay region. Uh, Beachmere Sea Grade and Bribe Island Reserve will do battle. Uh, Saturday afternoon, 5pm at Bribe Island, and they play off for the Noel Gallagher Shield. So that'll be a real good test to see how both those teams are faring. And uh, a little bit of a whisper across the street, and I think Mooney may have even given us the tip, uh, a very strong Beachmere senior side this year, of course. Uh, Steve Brown heading across from the Warrigals back to where he, he began um, with, with the Pelicans, and, and a few of that uh, Warrigals A-grade side following Steve back there as well. Um, to uh, really give that C grade side at, at Beachmere a, uh, a, a fair whack of firepower. So, going to be a fantastic night there on Friday night. Now, are uh, Beachmere going to put in a protest against New Orleans in the NBA? Well, look, they might have to. Of course. They've had the Pelicans number and their name for, for much As long as I've known, the Beachmere have been the Pelicans. So, of course, New Orleans. Hornets going to change the Pelicans next season. I think they could they get a buck out of this. I think if they had their very own unibrow, it might work, but I'm not sure there's too many floating about. Maybe the, the trade-off Pelicans. could be unibrow could come and play a, one game at fullback. How would Anthony Davis go as a rugby league player? I don't think he'd go through flash. I'd have LeBron in, in the oh, second row somewhere, but I don't, he's a bit stringy, Anthony Davis. Uh, uh, big fullback Paul Hoff style, I reckon. Uh, no, he's, I'm not sold. I, I think he'd handle C-grade. <laughs> I think. No disrespect to the C graders, of course, but he goes all right, Anthony Davis, as an athlete in general. Another quick thing, another really talented product from the uh, the Redcliffe area or the Moreton Bay area that uh, has gone and made his name overseas. Over, was was pegged for really big things, went off to the Roosters, played, played for the Roosters. I, I think the biggest thing for this gentleman was that he was probably he, he was the son of a BRL legend and he was compared to Alan Lang and now they're really big things to, to pile on a guy but he's still a really talented footballer and he's going to play for the Northern Pride this year and I'm talking of, of Sam Obst of course the son of Tony Obst, Redcliffe legend he'll play for the Northern Pride this year after spending nearly 10 years playing in uh, the UK, super talent there was always talk he'd come back for the Dolphins and look he may yet after a couple of seasons with the Northern Pride but a, a, a super talented uh, a player and I, I would really like to see him the red and white and the number nine jersey for the Dolphins this year after 
losing to Tommy Butterfield, but best of luck to Sammy Ops. And, and when the Dolphins play the Pride, we might try and get Sammy on the phone and have a chat to him about his career because it's, uh, along with your uh, Trent Claytons and even your Dane Campbells, these, these players that probably didn't cro- quite make it to the top at the NRL level, but it still had an amazing story and, and leagues just provide them with an amazing journey and they're, you know, out of the Moreton Bay region, shows you there's the many different pathways league can take you in. And along those similar lines, of course, former Caboolture player Paul Ayton uh, gearing up for a big season in the Super League over there in the UK as well, and one of their absolute star players. So there's uh, plenty of opportunities uh, right across the globe for Leeds. Just quickly, like we didn't mention when we talked Dolphins, Matty, of course, and I'm not sure there's too many people that, that wouldn't know or didn't expect it, but just in case, Petro Sivitasiva officially given the captain's armband at the season launch on Friday. So great news there, and, and a role that Petro spoke very fondly about taking on at the launch and, and was very eager to, to, to really, uh, you know, take on that role and, and provide a lot of leadership to the next generation of the Dolphins coming through as well. Yeah, no, I think it, it had to be done. You, you've got someone of, of Petro's stature in the game to not have him as your captain and capitalise on this, the you know, the interest level in him playing for the Dolphins. I, I think it was a really good move from the Dolphins. And the other news, Dolphins, I guess, related, Rugby League, Morton Bay Rugby League, we've got our newest team, and we might talk to someone from the next week, the North Lakes Kangaroos, who for the first time... Uh, the Dolphins Fogs Cup players who, who who don't make that Fogs Cup team will drop back and play for the North Lakes Kangaroos. So that's that's a really good move. A little bit of a false start last week with the weather affecting a lot of games in the Brisbane Second Division, but uh, round one has been shifted this week. So the North Lakes Kangaroos are taking on the Pine Central Holy Spirit Hornets, who of course were Pine Cup champions here uh, only a couple of weeks ago at Dolphin Oval on Saturday afternoon at 3pm. So if you're keen to get along and watch the, the Kangaroos play their first game, a, a great local derby against the Hornets, who have got plenty of uh, plenty of players there. Of course, one in, a former one in Zach Strasser there played a little bit of time at the Hornets as a junior. Uh, Great stuff there at Dolphin Oval. Very so good. Had that. Thanks again to all our guests this morning. And Swampy, finally, we've got 10 seconds left. Any views on the new putt? None. Nothing. Brushed Nothing. him. The Argentinian. <laughs> Swampy, no good. Okay, stand by now for the national news and then Morning Magazine.